Our speaker today is uh, Mikołaj Korzyński and he will tell us about geometric optics and drifts uh, in, in uh, general relativity. Okay, so thank you very much for invitation. Uh, I will give this talk uh, using the talk on Blackboard because this is more a report of, of progress of a, of a larger project, not something that is closed and you, you, you could basically squeeze it into a nice presentation. Uh, this may make it a little uh, not that nice to, to not that easy to give, but but on the other hand, it, it would also feel more authentic. It's not that I know all the answers to all possible questions. It's uh, it's the snapshot of what I know about this at the moment. Okay. <coughs> okay. So uh, let me first state the problem. So the, the geometric optics in general relativity is, is, is something of very, very uh, high importance in astronomy and in cosmology. And this has, in fact, been already studied by uh, many people. The classical papers were written by Zax in 1960s. I don't remember ex the exact date. I think it's 62, but I'm not sure. Uh, there is an old paper by Etherington. from 1930s, uh, and there is a nice review paper by Perlik uh, in the Living Reviews of Relativity. Living Reviews is a very interesting journal. Uh, it's, it basically consists of reviews of a given topic in general relativity. Uh, but these reviews change in time. The, the authors are, are expected to update year by year the reviews to give the, the most important results of the, of the recent years. So there is a review of uh, geometric optics in GR by Volker Perlik. Uh, so my seminar will be partially giving. I have no idea if. That's a very good question. I don't. I don't know. As far as I know, none, uh, none of the authors has passed away so far. The the the, the journal. <laughs> so that's a good solution. Let's publish, let's publish the, the, the short. <laughs> but but it's a very useful useful journal, and it, it has a nice chapter about these these things, uh, with all all possible references. So you can even trace the history of the of the topic. Uh, now, the, while everything in, in, in the base, almost everything is known in geometric optics, this is not, uh, this is not something you, you would expect to discover new things. Uh, there, is, there is a topic which hasn't been addressed so far, and this is the drift effects in cosmology. What, what do I mean by that? Well, when we observe the universe, we mostly observe the, the electromagnetic radiation from, from very far sources. Uh, but on the other hand, we know that the cosmological processes are very slow in comparison to, to our earthly characteristic time scale of 10, 20 years. So in a way, we don't expect many things to change in the, in the very deep background, uh, simply because the, the expansion of the universe is a very slow process. Basically, the order of, of magnitude, in the, the, the characteristic time order is giga years, uh, whereas the characteristic time of a uh, observational grant in astronomy is around 10, 20 years. So there is a big scale difference. Nevertheless, it's fairly obvious that if we wait for a sufficiently long time, we should be able to see some changes of, this, of, 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 of uh, the properties of the universe, of the large scale properties of the universe. And you might wonder what kind of changes you might expect and how to, uh, and try to predict how large they are and whether it is possible to observe them, whether it makes sense even to ask about that. So the first paper about the drift effects was written by Sandage in 1962. Sandage looked at the uh, at the simplest homogeneous model of the universe, the Friedman Lemet Robertson model with a completely uniform and uh, homogeneous uh, distribution of matter, and he noted that the as time passes, 
the positions of all distant sources as long as they follow, they don't have any peculiar motions, as, as long as they follow this cosmological uh, flow is fixed on the sky completely. On the other hand, the redshift does indeed change and it changes according to the following formula. Here you've got the uh, Hubble parameter, the expansion parameter of the universe at the observation time minus the Hubble parameter at the emission time and this is corrected by 1 over 1 plus z. So in principle there is a drift of the, of the redshift but it depends on the uh, Hubble parameter at the observation time but also at the emission time. And that's interesting because it's, it turns out that this quantity here actually allows us to prove redshift. It's the redshift. Z is the redshift. The energy, it has, I will get to that, but at the moment it's simply uh, the energy of a photon uh, at the, as, as it is emitted by, by an observer uh, divided by the energy as we observe it now, minus one. It's a standard quantity in astronomy. And of course, it can be different from zero from, for various reasons. But typically, if, if a source far away from us emits a photon, and if we observe it right here, we don't measure exactly the same energy. OK. Apart from that, another interesting quantity is the angular distance. The angular distance. Uh, because this guy is because this if you write it this way this becomes an additive quantity uh, I will get to that uh, the formulas end up to be slightly simpler if you use the logarithm uh, the thing is that if you have an if your light passes through a, a couple of, of, of if it passes through a number of, of uh, let's say places in the universe you can then you can consider then the logarithm of one plus z uh, is an additive quantity. You can you can the changes sum up instead of of of, of getting multiplicative. Yes. Exactly. Log of one plus z is basically log <coughs> e observation minus log. So so in a way this this should. Z is not the most convenient number to use. It's easy to calculate by astronomer, but from, from a theoretician's perspective, this is a nicer parameterization. But, but this one is, is the one we know. Uh, on the other hand, when we look at the angular distance, the angular distance from a, from a source is, is, is uh, one of the simplest uh, definitions of, of, of distance from a very far, from an object far away, and simply defined as the ratio between its size uh, as we see it on the sky, its angular size, uh, uh, sorry, is the ratio of its physical size by the angular size. If we imagine that there are no, if we imagine that we live simply in a Euclidean universe, uh, then we could guess the, the, uh, the distance from, from, from an object just by seeing how, how large it is on the sky. Uh, and if we knew how, how, how large, what its physical size is, then just by dividing these things, we would get the normal distance. In GR, it looks like a formula we use in the military service, which was called the competition, how to measure the height of the distance between the towers and the height of the that, that, that's exactly, in a way, this is exactly the thing. And this distance also, the logarithm of this distance also changes with time. And the funny thing is that the rate of change is exactly the same. If you do it this way. Yes. Uh, on, but this is something you rarely can measure in astronomy, almost never. What you typically measure is something called the luminosity distance. The luminosity distance. There is a logarithm here. What it means? It means that this thing is constant. And this is called the commoving distance, by the way. 
So one of the problems of cosmology for in cosmology for for lay people is that there is many notions of distances uh, which are related to each other by by complicated formulas. Uh, this one is simple in the sense that it, it is exactly related to, to uh, geometric optics. Uh, it basically it's basically related to the size of the of the object we see at, right now on Earth. Uh, but the one we usually use in in in, uh, in cosmology and astronomy is something called the luminosity distance. Uh, so imagine that we've got a light source and we know the. It's not a trivial. Okay, it's not trivial to show why it is constant. I can uh, later on. People at the very distant stars, they should have a size one. In some sense, therefore. I don't see any reason why they should have size one. Okay. If you if you are really interested, I can I can I can show you I can show the argument why this should be constant, but it will take something like ten minutes. Uh, in a good cosmology book, you, you, somebody will show you why, why, why this thing is actually constant for, for, for a source which, which follows uh, the, the cosmic flow. But this is not something we usually measure. What we measure is something called the luminosity I distance. The DA is not the size of the object. It is. It's something else. <laughs> OK, let, let me put it this way. Uh, so. You measure the, the size of the object in uh, yes. as, as, a, as, a, uh, as, a, as an angle. Right. Yes. So this is this is the sky. It, it takes a, a, a fraction of the whole four pi sphere, and then. Uh, and then I assume that I know its physical size. Traveling uh, there and making. Uh, I told you that this is not, excuse me, I told you that this is not what you measure. What you measure is luminosity distance, but I, we will get to that. At the moment, assume that somehow you know the physical distance of something very far away, and you know the fraction of the, of the full four pi. Uh, we, will, we will get to it. If I know the real physical size of the star, why should I carry it? Because the other measure of its size. Because it gives you a, a notion of distance from from its star, from the star, as this proportionality constant. So in, in standard 2D, this is just uh, the the. No, sorry. Right. So in standard, uh, we know that in in, in standard uh, flat space, if you if you know the the, the fraction of the full sky taken up by an object, and you multiply it by, by the di square distance, then you get the uh, area, the cross-section area of, 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 of an object. Exactly. Uh, I will get to that. What you can measure, usually, is the luminosity distance. The luminosity distance is something you, you assume that you've got an object which emits electromagnetic radiation with uh, with some kind of, with a total intensity which you know. And then, somewhere far away, you measure the flux of this electromagnetic radiation. And then you might, uh, and then uh, you can define the luminosity distance as the distance uh, you would have, you would infer by using the simplistic formula that the flux you measure is basically the intensity uh, divided by, 4 pi dl squared. So, in standard, in standard, in, in a standard space, if, if nothing strange happened, this would be basically equivalent to this dA, except that, that it's not measured by looking at the size, but rather at the flux of energy. And the fun thing is that in cosmology, sometimes you can measure that because for for certain types of, of sources, we believe we know the total intensity. For certain objects, we call it standard candles. A type of supernova is, is, is believed to be to be a good candidate for that. And 
and now there is a miracle. This is something that, that is not easy to show. It, in fact, these two distances are related to each other by something called the Etherington formula. This looks like a simple geometric fact, but it's not a simple geometric fact. It's a f fairly complex theorem to prove that uh, they're may related. What is assumed here? So, for example, this, this, this equation with this derivatives is the result of assumption that we are on Robertson Walker. Yes, and that's it. So, so Robertson Walker cosmology. Yes. FLRW, Friedman Lemaitre, Robertson Walker cosmology, and that's it. Okay. And from this relation, of course, you can get the drift of the luminosity distance as well. Mm. Okay, what is the feasibility of observation of these things? Well, it turns out that, that at least the redshift, this, the redshift drift is something people are already considering looking at. In particular, the uh, EELT telescope has, uh, one, among one of its many instruments, uh, an, a very stable s spectrograph, uh, which has a number of applications. But one of them is looking at the uh, so-called Lyman Alpha forests of very distant sources. Lyman Alpha forest is w what you see on a spectrum of a very distant quasar. Uh, what the light from this quasar passes through a number of, of clouds of hydrogen. Uh, these clouds, uh, in these clouds, uh, one of the one of the lines of hydrogen, which which is actually very narrow, uh, is eaten up. But si since uh, since the light passes through many of these clouds, moving at various, uh, which are positioned at different po positions, which move with different velocities, each of them eats up its own line. And what you see is a complicated pattern of of. The, the, of the impressions of the same line. And now the idea is that within something like 20 years, you should be able to see small, subtle changes of this, of this spectrum. And this way probe the uh, redshift drift. So uh, they claim that this, with an appropriate strategy, they'll be able to see the uh, difference of, of velocities of the order of centimeter per second. Uh, so this is not something you, you this is something you, in principle, should be able to, to observe. Uh, and also the uh, VLT, uh, another, uh, 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 another telescope in, in South America, has a spectrograph for which this is not a main scientific goal, but this is something people consider. And finally, the Square Kilometer Array, SKA, a very late large radio telescope, in, which is this time an American, Japanese, I think, Chinese. Uh, uh, project. Uh, we look at the redshift drift in, in, in the neutral hydrogen lines. Okay. Okay, so at the end of the day, what I want to sh show is. So th there, there is a paper dedicated just to that. You may study. physics reports. Uh, it's called real-time cosmology. It's basically dedicated to the to the problem of whether all of these drift effects are observable, and what you should do, how good instruments you would need to have, and how long you would have to wait in order to see any of these things. Uh, then there is a number of theoretical de developments here. So there are papers by Andrzej Krasiński, uh, Krzysztof Bolejko, and other people uh, who consider position and redshift drifts of, as probes of homogeneity of the expansion of the universe. But somehow I was not impressed by any of these papers because they lack something I like very much, a, a good, reasonable mathematical theory of, of these effects, which would match what we know about geometric optics uh, from the 1960s. And the first part I, I want to talk about is the uh, mathematical theory of the drift effects in arbitrary space-time. 
And this is a project uh, I have been doing with, with uh, three students of mine, uh, Filip Ficek, uh, Jarek Kopiński, and now we have Jan Miszkiewicz, who is not sitting here. Oh, well. Um, OK. So the idea is to look at the mathematical theory of drift effects. Uh, so we imagine that in a space-time we've got an emitter and an observer. And that a point called the emission point, this is the observer, this is the emitter, uh, they've got, they all have their four veloc velocities for accelerations. They don't need to be geodesic. They can move however they want. We assume that two points here are connected by null geodesics. And null, ge null geodesics in general relativity corresponds to basically light rays. Uh, this geodesic has got its own four velocity. Now, I found it very useful uh, to assume that the geodesic passes from the observer to the emitter. It turns out that, that, that this somehow simplifies m m many things. First of all, when you do numerical simulations, this is what, what, what you very often do. You've got a fixed observer, and then you shoot your geodesic backwards in time in order to see what uh, redshift and what, uh, what exactly this observer has been, uh, has been observing all, all the day long. So in my convention, P0 is, is the zero component of, of the four velocity is negative. So this geodesic uh, is directed backwards in time. Uh, so the emitter and the observer have, have their own four velocities. What else do we know? Uh, the covariate derivative of the observer, observer's uh, four velocity with respect to each other is called the four acceleration. The same for the emitter. I don't assume it to be zero. I don't assume it to be anything. It's just a vector here. Uh, and I assume that the light moves uh, along null geodesics, which means that the covariant derivative of this p with respect to p is 0. And you are still assuming No, what I'm saying now is absolutely general. The, the idea is that I can, OK, the, the final point is that I can, I can derive general formulas for all of these things. Zero means this is all. It means the observer, and this means the emitter. So you've got the emitter who follows a trajectory, an observer who follows a, a line. Is the standard? You calculate the derivative of this four velocity with respect to, to the proper time. No. Uh, directed directed along along the vector u zero. So z z zero is a e and o are just subscripts which. No, no, it's, it's along, so yes, it's the derivative along. Is the standard derivative along the uh, along the same vector or the derivative with respect to the proper time plus some corrections due to the. Uh, to the Christopher symbols. <clears throat> OK. Now, there is something very interesting about null geodesics in GR. Namely, they don't have a fixed parameterization. Uh, so curves which are, which are time-like, uh, curves which correspond to, 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 to massive objects, uh, have a fixed parameterization with something called the proper time. But the ugly thing about null, null curves is that they, they don't have a fixed parameterization. You, you, there is no, no parameterization. No parameterization would be in any way better than another. So let's take this null geodesic. It has a parameter, but this parameter can yeah, always be. Sc so there is no. This is it's true that you can introduce other affine parameters in other so geodesics. Those w velocities are dimensionless, right? Uh, 
So I'm working with c equal to 1. Uh, that's always true. Uh, okay, in, in, in norm, in standard, no, in standard, this, this is, uh, in standard, this is just meter over second squared. <coughs> this looks ugly, but this is nothing like, this is just the second derivative of the, this is just the derivative of the velocity, but in, in a complicated coordinate system, and with all relativistic effects, you have to use the covariant derivative here. Okay. Now, uh, this null geodesics has its own parametrization, but this parametrization can always be, you can always apply an, a fine uh, reparametrization to this curve, and this doesn't, this is just, this is not the same C. It's, it's just a parameter. These are just two parameters. You can always rescale the parametrization here. And then, and then the four velocity changes by, uh, sorry, and then the, the, the tangent vector to this curve changes by rescaling as well. Uh, so so there, there is an ambiguity of, of parametrization here we cannot fix. Uh, now the, what, what's the next problem? Okay, the next thing is the redshift. So from this setup, we can already calculate the redshift this observer sees with respect to the emitter, namely <coughs> z is basically p mu p e mu p mu e o mu minus 1. And this is nothing new. This is also standard, a standard formula. OK, but we're not just interested. Now, th this is an important point. Uh, at the moment, we're not interested just in one geodesic, but rather in a whole one parameter uh, family of, of geodesics, which first of which is right here, the one we started from. But then we want to have uh, a whole one continuous one parameter family which joins various points here with various points there. I make as an assumption that there is always that there is a one to one uh, correspondence here. If this is not the case, then we are dealing with something called a caustic, and caustics are quite complex. And I won't want, to, I don't want to go into that. Uh, at the moment, I assume that there are no caustics here, and uh, from each point here, you can send, send precisely one null geodesics which intersects this curve here. You don't need a black hole. You, in fact, in fact, you need to perturb this space only slightly to create to, to create caustics. Caustics are in fact very common. So, uh, okay. But at the moment, I assume that there is just a one-to-one -one correspondence for simplicity. Uh, so, if we do it this way, then we've got another vector field here defined, called I will call zeta, and this vector field connects points with the same value of the, of the affine parameter here. Uh, or to say differently, uh, we, we get a two surface, which is from one hand, on one hand ruled by null geodesics, but is also ruled by uh, another family of, of curves. These curves correspond to the same value of affine parameter. Uh, if we call lambda the, the, uh, the affine parameter, then there must be a complementary uh, vector field which spans these z zeta vectors. And these zeta vectors are very important which because of course is not unique. Yes, there is, you can always reparameterize each of these geodesics, which, which corresponds to, I, I will get to that. Oops, that's a danger. Uh, uh, what you know about these two vector fields is that they commute. Mm, so recall that P is the tangent vector field to these to these null geodesics. Z zeta is the uh, zeta is this other vector field. It's, it's sometimes called the. Uh, they are defined only on this two dimension. Yes, yes, yes. That's true. That's true. But you don't. You, but that's, that's fine. You can define, 
you can define the commutator because the commutator only involves the derivatives in directions uh, on the surface. But we know that something like this is true. And if we differentiate it with respect to P, use the standard uh, definition of the Riemann tensor, uh, we may get, in fact, an ordinary differential equation for this zeta, which is called the uh, geodesic deviation equation. Uh, I write it this way. Is equal to zero. So the second covariant derivative of zeta along the null geodesic is given by the product of the of a part of the Riemann tensor multiplied by zeta. Uh, this is a linear second order ODE, and it is also known in differential geometry. It roughly tells you how a neighboring geodesic behaves with respect to a given one. Uh, it's also called Jacobi equations. It's, it's, it's called geodesic, the geodesic deviation equation. It's, it's one of very fundamental things in differential geometry. Uh, and in a way, large part of my seminar will be about this equation. I wonder how far I will get. OK. So before we go any further, I want to note two things about this equation. Namely, uh, it looks like a second order ODE for a, for a quantity which has four, uh, which has four components. So something which has, in principle, an eight-dimensional space of solutions. But I want to state that, in fact, uh, there is much fewer. There, on, only half of these equations matter. Part, part, part of these equations are not physical. There is something you can, in principle, get rid of. And I want to get. I want to show you why and how. Okay. So what we know is that so we've got the geodesic deviation equation. And there is something which can and what we can do is to multiply this equation by P alpha. And if we do it, we find out a funny statement that the second derivative of the scalar product of zeta with the, four, the, the, the tangent vector to the null geodesic is equal to 0. And from that, we, in, we, uh, we get uh, very easily that this is equal to some kind of e plus f lambda. So for free, we get two constants of motion for these equations, e and f, just by uh, noting this, this, this trick. Uh, so in a way, we have solved two of these equations irrespective of what the Riemann tensor is. These are not physical degrees of freedom in a way. They don't depend on, 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 on the Riemann tensor. They don't depend on geometry. For any geometry, if we do this multiplication, we get, we get the statement that this is a linear function in, in this parameter lambda. Uh, OK. So in a way, we have solved two of the eight uh, we have found two of, of, of the two parameters of the whole eight parameters on which this solution depends. Uh, and secondly, you can also check that once we have a solution, zeta alpha of lambda, we can we can add something proportional to p alpha. So, so, so you take a linear function of, of lambda uh, multiplied by the, by the p alpha, the, the null vector right here. And this will also always, always be a solution of this equation as well. So there is a, there is a in a way, gauge symmetry here. Uh, for each solution here, this is also a solution. This has, by the way, a simple physical interpretation, something Professor Kijowski was mentioning. When we have one solution, when we have a fixed geodesic, a fixed null geodesics, and, and, and a solution of the 
geodesic deviation equation. This gives a neighboring geodesic, but we can always reparameterize these geodesics. And this situation to this point here, slightly diff we'll assign to a given point here a slightly different point on this neighboring geodesic. And this freedom of reparameterization is exactly the freedom given by these two things. First of all, you can shift the whole reparameterization uh, by a constant, and this is this g. Or you can, in fact, uh, use a parameter which, which has, in a way, a wider spacing of, of constants. And this is this h. Exactly, but here I'm doing this in, in an infinitesimal level, in a way. Right, so we've got out of eight degrees of freedom, uh, out, of eight par uh, out of eight constants on which the general solution of this depends, we already have four. And there is only four which really depend on the space time we have chosen and on the Riemann tensor here and on the Christoffel symbols and everything else. So, No, exactly, and apart, I hope I will just uh, at least will be able to tell you how to get rid of them. <laughs> yes, I've got, I've got another one. Uh, okay, now, in case of, of space-like geodesics, uh, you, you don't, in a way, you don't have to worry about that because you can do a simple trick. You can s state that from now on, I'm only interested in the solutions of this equation, which are perpendicular to the vector p. So when I have another geodesics, I'm, I'm only interested in, in these geodesics parameterized in such a way that the separation vector is perpendicular to p. Right? You can always, given any solution, you can always ensure that this is true by applying a transformation of this kind. And if you do it, this becomes zero. So for Space like geodesics, you can use these two constants to make these two constants zero. And stop worrying about this what's at all. Uh, we, 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 this way, you have extracted all physical degrees of freedom of this so, 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 equation, and you're happy. But unfortunately, for null geodesics, this is not possible. So, for null geodesics, what happens is that even if you add something proportional to p, this does not affect this product at all. So you cannot use this gauge freedom to do something with these numbers E and F. And that's very interesting. It means that you have to deal with this gauge dependence, uh, with this gauge freedom in a more clever way. Uh, uh, I'm not saying that this is actually physical. Uh, uh, this is physical in the sense that it has an interpretation. I will get to that. What is not physical is the is adding p to, to zeta. What I'm saying is that these two degrees of, that, that this solution always looks this, looks this way, independent of, of, of the geometry. No, not even that. OK, but uh, OK, let me go to my next batch of notes. Uh, OK, but there, there is something very nice. Uh, if we're interested in geometric optics and in, in GR, if, if we are looking at uh, at rays emanating from an object, then there is something funny we note. So imagine we've got an observer, and we've got a bunch of geodesics which, uh, which come from the emitter. The emitter has a small but finite size, but if we are looking at, if we are interested in the size, uh, in the angular size of an object an emitter sees, we are interested in a bunch of geodesics which intersect each other at the, at the observation point. We idealize that the observer is a single point. And what does this mean? Well, this means that the zeta alpha we are interested in at the point of observation is equal to zero. And what does this mean? Well, this means that p alpha zeta alpha is 0 at this observation point. Secondly, since we are interested only in null geodesics, we have to make sure that this condition is preserved. And this means, I won't show the details, but this means that uh, the first derivative of alpha has to be perpendicular to p. 
everywhere. Now it turns out that so this condition has to be uh, satisfied. This condition simply means that f needs to be equal to 0. So this guy has to be constant. On the other hand, we have noticed that we are interested in, in bunches of, of, of in rays of, of, of geodesics which intersect at one point. So at this one point, this has to be 0. But if this is equal to 0 at one point, it has to be equal to 0 everywhere. So for the for the geodesics we are interested in, we know that zeta alpha p alpha has to be equal to 0 everywhere, which is interesting. So it turns out that uh, in geometric optics, we are only interested in E and F equal to 0 case. And now we still have this, this ugly G and H. And it turns out that there is a simple way to get rid of them, namely, Oh, sorry. Just before before we go, this looks like an abstract, weird uh, statement, but in fact it has a geometric interpretation. It means that we are looking at photons which stay at the same light front. So imagine we've got an observer who stands right here. At a given moment, the central photon passes this observer, and this observer notes the position of, of other fo photons of this ray. It turns out that this observer will notice that uh, these, these photons at this very moment are positioned at uh, positions which are uh, perpendicular to the direction of propagation here. And the funny thing is that this, this uh, condition is Lorentz invariant. So if one, uh, only one observer notices that for a given photon these other photons are displaced in a perpendicular manner from this from this one uh, to the direction of propagation, any other will, will notice this too. This is uh, this is not a trivial fact, but but this is true. So the condition that a bunch of of photons lies on the same light front, that one is displaced with respect to the other uh, only by something perpendicular to the direction of propagation. This is Lorentz invariant, and this is exactly encoded in this equation right here. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Now, uh, how to get rid of G and H? Well, it turns out that this is very simple. You need to pass to a space uh, which is which is a quotient space. So we take a subspace of the tangent space right here, the space of vectors which are orthogonal to P. It's a three-dimensional space. And we divide it by P itself. So if you haven't done GR, this must look like something very weird. You take the space of all vectors per orthogonal to a vector and then divide by this vector. This is weird, but 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 if this vector is null and if the signature is not positive, this is something you, you sometimes have to do. So in the full space, you take the space of, of vectors which are per per perpendicular to P. Imagine a, a, a subspace right here. And now the weird thing about null vectors is that they're orthogonal to themselves. So in fact, the vector orthogonal to the subspace lies on the subspace. And now you can divide it by this by this p. By w w why, would you why would you do it? Well, for starters, uh, this way we would get rid of that. As I said, uh, uh, adding something proportional to p to these vectors only amounts to changing the parametrization, but does not physically change the no neighboring null geodesic. And secondly, it turns out that the physical metric tensor, g mu nu, uh, is actually degenerate on this uh, on this space. Uh, it's degenerate in direction of p. So the product of of two vectors from this subspace does not does not depend is, is insensitive to, to to adding or sub subtracting something proportional to p. So imagine we we take two vectors which are perpendicular to p. Uh, and then uh, 
if we take the product, it turns out to be equal to uh, to the product of any vectors you get by adding something proportional to p. Uh, so if nothing is sensitive to, to adding or subtracting something proportional to p, this means that you can simply get rid of this, you can simply divide your, your space by p, and this way you get a two-dimensional space which has, on which the metric tensor is actually well defined, and this metric tensor uh, has signature plus plus. And it turns out that you can in fact pull the whole geodesic deviation equation back to this uh, quotient space. It's uh, yes, but I don't like this 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 name, and I will tell you why. It's possible, but, I, but I've also seen. Okay, when was that? Because Sachs uses the same name in '62, I think. Okay, the, I've seen this name, and I don't quite like it. The, uh, the bottom line is that this is this is an abstract abstract space of photons, which which lie at the same wave front. And in this space, we don't worry which point corresponds to which point here. Mm, OK. Yes. Yes, it's an abstract space in which we forget about this, this ugly part. And in this space, this is a two-dimensional space. I won't show you the details, but you can pull back this equation to this space. And, and there, uh, this equation is a second order ODE in a two dimensional space. So it has four general solution depending on four constants, which is exactly the physics of the problem. So the first advantage of this approach is that you get rid of the unphysical degrees of freedom and you, you're just back to the real meat of the problem. But there is another advantage of, of doing it this way. And this has more to do with, with the Lorentz invariance of this whole formalism. Namely, uh, uh, namely, OK, the way Sachs does these things is, is, is the following. In his papers, Sachs introduces a, a basis, a, a frame, a, a set of four vectors, orthogonal vectors, one of which is the four velocity of this guy. Another one is looked directed along the, 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 the position of the, uh, along the direction of propagation. And there are two others, two other vectors which parameterize the perpendicular space to the direction of propagation. And uh, once you do it, you've got a two-dimensional subspace which is perpendicular to the uh, direction of propagation, and you can use it to uh, to extract information from this from this equation. The problem is uh, this 2 plus 1 splitting depends on the four velocity of the observer. For different observers at this point, you would get different 2 plus 1 splitting. And formally, this equation, the, the results here might, might in fact depend on the way you position this u, u0 initially. But this is not the case, really. In fact, if you, if you do it carefully in this p space, uh, you will see that nothing whatsoever depends on the on the four velocity of the observer. It's because changing the velocity of the observer uh, can only result in rotating these two vectors uh, here along the uh, direction z, and perhaps adding something proportional to p. But in this space, it doesn't matter. So doing so makes all all the all the thing manifestly. Lorentz invariant. What's the time I have? OK. So I won't do very much, unfortunately. So at, at the moment, all I managed to do is just the standard stuff. I didn't manage to get to the uh, Now, I will, I will do one, one new thing, then. Uh, so there is an important notion here, this notion being the something I call the linking vector.
and the linking vector. So let's go back to our original picture right here. Uh, so imagine we know the, op the four velocity observer, we know the four velocity of the emitter, and we want to know uh, what zeta corresponds to taking the next null geodesics, which would uh, originate uh, from a point slightly later at the observer's for uh, at the observer's trajectory, and will certainly hit the emitter's trajectory, also at some later point. Uh, what zeta corresponds to that? Well, obviously it has to satisfy the geodesic deviation equation. It has to satisfy the GDE. Yes, exactly. So GDE. So zeta has to satisfy the GDE, obviously. On the other hand, we need to specify the, the initial conditions for this GDE. And the initial conditions, uh, OK. First of all, at the observation point, this is fairly obvious. It has to be basically the four velocity vector right here. On the other hand, we don't know the uh, we don't know the derivative of p at this point. But what we know is that at the emission point, it has to be well, it has to be basically the four velocity of the emitter, but not quite. It has to be proportional to it, with some proportionality constant. Uh, why? Well, because you, know, you should know from your special relativity course that the, the time lapse we observe is not quite the proper time lapse of, of, of your source. There is just a depend. There is something here, and of course, it has to be null geodesic, which means that this has to be satisfied. So you need to solve the geodesic deviation equation with not with boundary conditions, but rather with initial conditions at two points, which is not the, which is slightly awkward. But the thing is uh, that you can s simplify this. Uh, okay, I discovered that you can simplify that, uh, and I will show a few. S in fact, you can reduce this thing to, to basically uh, solving it with standard ODEs, but you have to look at that step by step. So first, we note that for vectors of this kind, we know that zeta alpha p alpha is conserved. So if we multiply both initial conditions by p alpha, we discover that d times u e alpha p alpha <coughs> is equal to u o alpha p alpha. So d is nothing else but 1 over 1 plus z. So d is not something new. D is something we already knew. It's basically the redshift, and this makes sense because the redshift is not just the uh, it's not just how the energy of, of a photon has changed since E has emitted it. It's also the the difference uh, of the time lapse between the the time lapse we observe and the time lapse in the in the reference right here. Okay, so we can trade this. For this, and now we just have really okay. Before that, we had fairly complicated uh, conditions. We had an initial condition on lambda e, f f initial conditions on lambda in lambda o, initial conditions in lambda e, but with an unknown constant, and an additional condition. Now we have, we really have. So we've got an initial and final condition. Uh, what's the time? I've got three minutes. OK, at, at, at the end of the day, OK, just one more thing. From zeta, you can extract something very important, namely the position drift. So you can extract how the position of, a, of something changes in the sky, uh, namely this guy right here calculated at the observation time. 
And this is nothing else but the derivative of p alpha with respect to zeta at the observation time. But at the observation time, zeta is nothing else but the for velocity. Well, this is basically how how the for velocity of uh, sorry how the for momentum of the of the photon coming from the source changes in time and this of course has the information about the direction from which it comes encoded here basically you need to project it into the perpendicular plane to p so once you solve these equations the derivative of of psi at the observation points gives you the position drift on the sky of of, of your object you can also calculate a similar quantity right here, and it will tell you about something I, called, I would call the apparent librations. What I mean is that if you have a time-dependent uh, bending of gravitational lights, then even if this object does not rotate, you will see it from a slightly different angle, just because the, 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 uh, this, this light has been bent. So, f f and, and, and this is something you will find from the first derivative of psi at the emission point. Uh, and I have found a beautiful formula for this quantity, but I don't have time to tell you about it. Anyway, there is a very nice, neat formula. You, in fact, you don't need to solve explicitly this, this differential equation. There is a very neat formula for this, this guy right here, but I don't have time to tell you about it because I would need another 20 minutes, I guess. But the, at the end of the day, there, there are closed formulas for, for the drifts of all possible quantities here. The drift formula for the position is very simple. The drift formula for the redshift is not that simple, but you, you can have it. And there is a general formula for the angular distance drift, which is quite complicated. And it's first derivatives. OK, in the, uh, in the, the first derivative, the derivative of the Riemann tensor appears only in the uh, <coughs> angular distance drift. In the position drift and in the uh, redshift drift, all that appears is just the Riemann tensor, but in a rather complex manner. Uh, I can show you later what, how it's actually. Riemann tensor is zero. Can you use the formula to show that that apparently the sphere is the sphere? Yes. So, so you can. I suppose it should be easy. Yes. Uh, okay. Okay. W w what I can say. What I can say is that. Okay. In case of Riemann equal to zero, this really, these formulas really degenerate to the special relativity formulas for 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 everything, which are very simple to derive. So. Yes. Quite easily. Okay. You, you'd have to. I would have to introduce something called the Jacobi matrix. If you introduce the Jacobi matrix, this becomes very simple. Okay, that's it for today. I, okay, I have I have material for another hour of of, of telling you, but I, I don't have time for that. Thank you. of refraction. So we assume that there is no refraction. So in general relativity... And all you are yeah. talking about is refraction. Okay, okay, index, okay. index of refraction. Okay, can, 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 can you define it? Okay, in order to, to define it, you'd have to some, have something like a, a reference space for which... Okay, let, let me put it this way. This is not the way you normally do it. The way you normally... So the, the, the different. Mm, I think that no, it's not clear to me that you can always do it. Yes, it's possible, but it has never been done. Okay. Okay. The, the, the main problem is that. Okay. The main problem is that the refraction index is just. First of all, the refraction index is a scalar quantity. And if it were possible, so you, 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 you locally, it is always one. But here he wants to take into account uh, effects which are not local. very local. So, so, so 
The answer is, I, I don't is think you can... also so that in the actual cosmological situation, most of the time between mm -hmm. the source and the mm -hmm. observer, there's almost exactly the Minkowski space. Yeah? No, that's not true. That's not true. Uh, okay, it's true locally in the sense that in every every point of space-time there's a very small fraction which looks like Minkowski space, but uh, if you look at this globally, then no, it's not true. For, for, first of all, for, for sources which have redshifts close or larger than one, you need to take into account basically the cosmological model you, you're working with, which entails taking into account the curvature of the space-time already. <laughs> So, 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 so z equal to 1 is equivalent to basically sufficiently large distance that you need to take into account the curvature. Uh, so that there is one reason why you should... Uh, you just, uh, I just realized that there is an important reason why what, what you're saying is probably not possible. So the refraction index is a scalar. So if, if, we, if, if I only consider th things called, called scalar perturbations or perturbations which reduce to scalars, this is what people do, by the way, in cosmology very often, then probably you can do it. But there are also perturbations which are vector or vectorial, vectorial tensorial. And I don't think that for these type of effects you'll be able to deal with just one scalar field. Can I ask? Yes, sure. Yes. It applies to any space time whatsoever. No, but I mean, is it applied? Uh, the answer is yes. Yes, because we know from Isaacson's papers that gravitational waves in appropriate approximation behave exactly like, exactly travel along null, null geodesics. So the, the point is that the, the uh, wavelength has to be very small with respect to the characteristic curvature of, of, of space-time. Then you can treat everything as ripples, and these ripples move along null geodesics. Basically, use the WKB approximation. 